Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is truth. Thank you that you love us more than we love ourselves. We pray that you'd help us to tap into these systems that you've put in your word, to apply them to our lives and to follow the patterns and to believe the promises and to activate the principles. And we give you praise for the work that you will do through us by your word. In the name of Yeshua, amen. All right. So um, I want to read a story to you. This is, so I want to read a story to you from, from Mark chapter 5. So when you read the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, have you, anybody ever wondered why are they different, right? Why, is, why, why are they giving different accounts? Okay, the reason, they're different, giving, the reason they're giving different accounts is because they're presenting Christ from a different perspective. So Matthew presents Jesus as the king, right? Mark presents Jesus as the servant. Luke presents Jesus as the son of man. John presents Jesus as the son of God. And so they're showing that aspect. Now, what's really interesting is um, if you look at the genealogy of Christ in Matthew, I think it goes back to David, right? But if you look at the genie, because he's showing him as the king, David was the king, right? And Jesus is in David's kingly royal lineage. Uh, if you look at Luke, his genealogy goes back to Adam because he's showing him as the son of God. If you look at John, in John, it goes all the way back to God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God because it's showing him as the Son of God. So they're showing his genealogy from his father's side. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him, it was not anything made that was made. But in Mark, there's no genealogy. Why is there no genealogy in Mark? Because it's showing him as a servant, and it doesn't matter where a servant came from. right? And so when you're reading Mark, one of the things you'll notice is you'll notice that it's very fast paced. You'll see the word immediately and straightway and forthwith and the next thing and the next thing. And it's always like, it's like, it's like, it's like you can't catch your breath, right, when you're reading the book of Mark. And that's where we find ourselves in this story. And it says, and when Jesus passed over again, this is Mark chapter 5, verse 21. And when Jesus passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him. And he was nigh unto the sea. So uh, if, if, if you ever have an opportunity to go to Israel, like that opportunity presents itself again, like you, you do not want to miss that. Like it's mind-blowing. Because like when I read this, I can see the place where he, in my mind where he stood by the Sea of Galilee on this hill. And it's, just, it's, it, it's just another level. Anyway, so um, he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh unto him one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now, you got to understand, this is one of the rulers of the synagogue. The rulers of the synagogue were not fans of Jesus. They were not fans of Christ. They were not followers of Christ. So, so, but when you find yourself in a desperate situation... And somebody that you love who depends on you, like, needs a miracle, you care more about that than you do about saving face amongst your friends, amongst your colleagues. You don't care about what people think about you. You don't care if you're going to get excommunicated. You don't care if people are going to talk bad about you. I say what you have to say about me, but my daughter's dying. Okay? And um, he asked Jesus to come and lay hands on her that she may be healed. And Jesus went with him. And much people followed him and thronged him. So throng means, it means they were so crowded around, it was hard for him to move. They were like, everybody was trying to get close to him. And they, were th they thronged him. And a certain woman, would ha which had an issue of blood 12 years. I, I probably shouldn't go into all the details, but I'm going to. So when you understand, like, so when it says there was a certain woman had an issue of blood 12 years, that, that is significant. Why is that significant? Because every number has significance. And 12 is the number of perfect government. That's why there were 12 tribes in Israel. That's why there are 12 disciples, apostles. And so 12 is the number of perfect government. Anyway, um, which is why um, when a child turns 12 in the Hebrew culture, they get bar mitzvahed because now they are of the age where they should be able to govern themselves. The whole idea of adolescence is a, man, is a concept that was manufactured by people who wanted to keep people as children longer so because they know that the two people you can count on consuming more than is necessary are children and addicts. And so the longer we can keep them children, the more stuff we can get them addicted to. And so like, 
in the early 1900s, even the United States of America, people would graduate from the eighth grade, right? And they would go to work as an adult. This whole idea of adolescence and teenage is, is, a man, is a, like a manufactured construct. Anyway, I diversed. Anyway, 12 years. 12 years. She had an issue of blood. Now, she had an issue of blood for 12 years. An issue of blood meant like she, her, her menstrual cycle never stopped for 12 years. Now, you got to understand, so this is not just a physical ailment. This is a social, like, disgrace. Because in the Old Testament, and when, when, a woman, when a woman was menstruating, she wasn't allowed to touch anyone, and no one was allowed to touch her because they would be uncle ceremonially unclean until the evening. If she sat on something and somebody else sat on it, they would be unclean until the evening. So, so like, you're not allowed to have any physical contact with anybody for 12 years. So she's an outcast, and she's sick, and she's exhausted, and she has all of the stuff that goes with that, right? And, um, and it also says not only was she, did she have an issue of blood 12 years, she had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. So now she, she's, at a, she's at a level of desperation that few of us can imagine. 12 years of trying to solve this crazy problem that shouldn't be happening, and it's nothing fixes it, and not only is it not getting better, it's getting worse, and I spent all my money. Okay. So, and the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing this is because these were real people just like we are. They were going through real things and feeling real pain and real anxiety just like we do. And it says, um, when she had heard of Jesus... What did she hear? I don't know. Maybe she heard about the fact he opened somebody's blind eyes. Maybe she heard that he healed a leper. That had never been done before. Maybe she heard that he raised up Lazarus. Maybe she heard that he walked on the water. Maybe she heard that he fed 5,000 men with uh, fish and bread, not even including the women and children. I don't know what she heard, but she heard something that caused her to say, if I can just get to him, I think everything is going to be okay. And it, it's the fact that she had this disease 12 years is showing us that this situation in her life had perfect control over her. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you feel like that situation has had perfect control over her? And by the way, what's really interesting, the story, even though it's not even about her, she's an interruption. Jesus is on his way to heal this man's daughter who's sick, who also happens to be 12 years old, okay? Now, watch what it says. It says, she had suffered many things of many physicians but, um, and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. And when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. And, and so you've seen Jewish people wear tallits, right? Tallits are these things that are hanging off, okay? So she touched his tallit. You know the, the verse in the Old Testament where it says, that he will have healing in his wings, that wings are the talits. That's how she knew, like if I, if I, if I touch his talit, I know I'll be healed. And so, she, Sherajee's, she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I will be whole. And straightway, the fountain of her blood, uh, I, I skipped, okay, uh, when she had heard of Jesus, she came behind the press and touched his garment. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she, felt, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest that the multitude thronging thee, and thou sayest who touched me? What's he saying? His disciples, he said, who touched me? This type of say, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody touched you. Like everybody wants to touch you. Oh, 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 how are you? Oh, oh, oh. If it was now, then, can I take a selfie? Right? Right? Everybody wanted to touch him. What do you, what do you, they're like, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody touched you. And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. Told him what, all what truth? Well, I've been sick for 12 years and I've not been able to touch anybody. Nobody's been able to touch me. I've not been able to, like, so now she's going into a story? Let's don't forget, 
This for her is her miracle. But for Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, this is the disruption that followed his intention. He's like, he's like, I, I, I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine because I'm a father and I've got a daughter and there's nothing a father wants to do more than protect his daughter. Fathers want to protect their sons too, but not as much as they want to protect their daughters. I'm just telling you how it works, right? My son would fall down and bump his knee. He'd cry. Oh, he's supposed to bump his knee. Stop crying. You're supposed to bump your knee, right? My daughter would fall down and bump her knee. Come here, baby, right? So it's different, right? I'm sure that won't be my daughter's version when she watches this video. Um, anyway. <laughs> All right, so anyway, so, so Jairus is thinking, Jairus is thinking, why are you stopping? Okay, she touched you, she got healed, can we go? Why are you, letting, why are you taking all this time to let her tell you this big, long, drawn-out story? My daughter is dying. Are y'all seeing it now? And... His disciples said, okay, uh, verse 32, he looked around and see her, verse 33, the woman, fearing what trembling was done, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. And while he yet spake, while he's saying this to this woman, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? It's too late. It's too late. She's already died. There's nothing we can do because we all know that death is final. And I can imagine the thoughts going through Jairus' mind. If, if, if this woman wouldn't have just, if she wouldn't have touched him, if he wouldn't have stopped to ask her the question, if, 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 ah, oh, my daughter's dead. Okay, what's Jesus going to say about this? Verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, spoken, he saith unto her, unto the ruler of the synagogue, be not afraid, only believe. What? Okay, can you imagine a situation more dire? Can you imagine a situation more traumatic than while the only hope you have is on the way to fix the problem, your daughter's sick, you get news that she's dead. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, you poor thing. He says, be not afraid, only believe. Now, let's think about this this morning. He didn't say, fear not, only believe, because fear is something that we do. Like, fearing is something that we do. He didn't say don't fear. He said, don't be Afraid. <laughs> Be not afraid. Watch this part now. Only believe. Oh, that's a master key. That's a master class. That is masterful. Be not afraid. Only believe. See, one of the things that we have to do as followers of Christ, we have to learn how to be not afraid and how to only believe. That is, I'm, it's giving me chills. It's literally making the hair stand up on my arm. Be not afraid of what people are going to think about you when you're following Christ, only believe. Be not afraid of the bad news that has come and the bad news that will come, only believe. Yeah, but Myron, you don't understand. You don't understand. Inflation's at an all-time high. Be not afraid only believe. But, but Myron, you don't understand. I lost my job. I'm about to lose my home. Be not afraid. Only believe. How do you do that? How do you only believe? Like, what does only believing look like? It, it, here's what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. See, this is not a, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief situation. This is a, be not afraid only believe situation. And I am going to tell you one of the most under-exercised spiritual muscles that we all possess is the muscle of being not afraid and only believing. We, don't, we very rarely have faith that is not mixed with doubt. Can I get a witness? But one of the things we have to learn how to do, when God says something, 
we have to know that it's more than just true. It is truth. And because it's truth, it cannot change. And Jesus said to this woman, what he would like to say to you in your situation and me in my situation, be not afraid, only believe. Think about the times that Jesus told people to believe. Think about the times that Jesus asked people if they believed. Oh, that reminds me of another story. Mary and Martha, they come to Jesus. He gets word, Lazarus, your friend Lazarus is sick. And when he heard it, he tarried for four more days. <laughs> he said, oh, he's sick? Let me take my time. Let me show folk that I don't just have victory over the devil. I don't just have victory over disease. I am victory over death. And, and Martha said, if you, if you had only been here, my brother wouldn't have died. She said, I am the resurrection and the life. <laughs> he that believeth in me shall never die. And who's, I mean, whosoever believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And then you know what he said after that? Believest thou that? Believest thou this? Do you believe that? Can you believe what God said in your ears when what you see with your eyes is telling you the exact opposite. Maybe that's why the scripture tells us that we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. Because doubt is created in the eyes and faith is created in the ears. Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he, come, and he cometh into the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he seeth the, tum, the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly. <laughs> because when you love somebody and they die, that's how you cry. And when you're a mourner in the Hebrew culture, when somebody else mourns, you mourn with them, and you mourn like they mourn. And he cometh into the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and he seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly, and when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado? Why y'all acting like this? And weep. The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Now the next part really trips me out. And they laughed him to scorn. They went from <laughs> Did you hear what he just said? So most of them were fake crying anyway. You don't go from that to that. They were, putting on a, they were putting on a performance. The damsel's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. And when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, who? Peter and James and John, the brother of James. He took them, the damsel's parents, and... Um, he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumai, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway, which means immediately, the damsel arose and walked, for she was the age of 12 years old. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it. And he commanded that something should be given her to eat. What in the world just happened? I mean... Just reading it took me long enough. Well, we see a couple of things happen. One, we see all of the obstacles that Jesus had to go through. Well, we didn't even see all of them. We saw some of them. Because if you read chapter 4, Jesus passes over, he, he passed over to the, the first side of the sea, and when he passed over, he, just fell, he was so exhausted, he fell asleep on the boat, and he was asleep, I love this, on a pillow. <laughs> And the scripture says, a great storm came, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. The ship is full of water, and Jesus is asleep on a pillow? Why does it, why does it say this? I, I believe it's showing us that Jesus is both calm and comfortable in the midst of the storm. And they woke him up and said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and he looked up to the heavens and said, Peace, looked down at the waves and said, Be still. And with the right arm of deity, he ironed the wrinkles out of the waters, drove them across the seas until they buried their head, buried their head on some distant shore like a whip puppy. 
And they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? I love the fact that it says, it actually says, it says, he rebuked the wind, but he said unto the sea, peace be still. Isn't that interesting? He didn't rebuke the sea, but he rebuked the wind. Why? Because wind in scripture is a picture of false doctrine, and false doctrine must be rebuked. Waves in scripture are a picture of false doubt. Christ doesn't rebuke our doubts. He speaks to our doubts because faith is created in the ears. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But he went over the sea, calm storm. Then there meets him a man who's like possessed of the devils, and he, he does a miracle for that man. And, he, and, he, and then he does whatever work he's doing over there in chapter 4, and then he gets back in the ship and goes back to the other side, and then the ruler of the synagogue meets him. <laughs> Like, this is like, what? Like, what is going on? Talk about an action-packed thriller. So Jesus passed over the adversity of danger. He prevailed over the adversity of the devil. He um, preserved a woman uh, through the adversity of her disease. And now he prevailed over death. What do we learn from this? I'm going to write something on this. I'm going to write something on the board. Oops. What is that word? Everybody, what's the word? Believing. Believing. Okay, I'm going to write uh, something else. Let me see. Um, What's that word? Come on, talk to me, my peeps. Where y'all at? Y'all sleep? You should have done a cold plunge this morning, y'all be awake. Okay. <laughs> What's that word? Believing. Let's read all three of them. Believing, believing, believing. One more time. Believing, believing, believing. What do we learn from this? You will be living what you're believing, even though you be lying. What does that mean? means anything I tell myself about a future outcome, I made it up. Unless I'm telling myself the same thing that God has already told me. Then I don't need to make it up. (laughs) Believing, believing, believing. Do you understand that everything in your life flows out of your beliefs? Your beliefs create your belief. Your believing creates your believing. Maybe that's why Jesus said, be not afraid. Because if you will be afraid, then you're going to do what afraid people do. You're going to say what afraid people say. You're going to act like afraid people act. Don't be afraid. Be not afraid. Only believe. I think it's really fascinating because he's not only telling us not to be afraid, he's telling us how not to be afraid. How do I not be afraid? Only believe. Never give energy to outcomes you desire. By the way, Fearing not and only believing doesn't make every situation better. Because sometimes you'll believe something and it won't happen. You'll believe that a family member is going to be healed, somebody you love is going to be healed, and they're going to die anyway. So, so, well, Myron, why should I believe? Because believing makes you better. Why? It shows that you trust God. More than you trust your own understanding, which, by the way, is always going to be limited. My understanding is always going to be limited. See, We have to get to the place where we fear not anything in the temporal world because we only believe in in and the words of the eternal God. We have to believe the words of God so much and who he is and his nature and his character and his intention so much that we don't be afraid. We only believe. I've, I've heard people ask the question, what would you attempt if you knew you could not fail? Is that a good question? What would you, what, like, what would you attempt if you knew you couldn't fail? Well, you'd, you'd probably attempt more than you're attempting right now, right? Like, what would you attempt to make your, fa- your family like if you knew it wouldn't fail? What would you attempt to make your business like if you knew you couldn't fail? We, we, we approach everything we do worrying about what if it doesn't work. That is such a terrible question to ask. 
It's a terrible question to ask. All the, it's, it's almost always, if you're embarking on a new endeavor, asking what if it doesn't work is always a bad question. A better question is, how awesome is this going to be when it works? Now, if you're evaluating whether or not you should be doing something, perhaps, what if this doesn't work is okay. <laughs> because we, the scripture says, the foolish believe every word, right? I'm, I'm sorry, the wise, uh, the simple believeth every word, but the wise man looketh well to his going, right? So we, we want, we, like, skepticism is good, but don't mistake your negativism with skepticism. Skepticism says, I've already, I don't think this is going to work and I don't want to be confused by the facts. <laughs> negativism says, I mean, I'm sorry, negativism says, negativism says, I don't believe this is go- can happen and I don't want to be confused with the fact. Skepticism says, I don't believe this is going to work, but I'll give you an opportunity to prove to me that it can. Right? So skepticism is good. Negativism is bad. So in conclusion, here's what we know. Jesus told this man, be not afraid, only believe. When he went into the man's house and everybody else was crying, I don't think the man was crying because he had already heard Jesus say, be not afraid, only believe. He put everybody out but the man and his wife. Why? And Peter and James and John. Why? Because he knew they were the ones who could only believe. When you are working on something, in your life and in your business. The thing that you cannot afford to have in your environment is people who don't only believe. Faith will cause you to ask for things doubt won't let you ask for. Faith will give you access to what doubt won't let you access. And faith will cause you to act in ways doubt would never let you ask. Reminds me of James chapter 2, where it says, faith without works is dead. See, people misinterpret James chapter, James chapter 2, and they think that James is saying that faith, uh, that works, helps, help, works help faith save you. That's not what it's saying. In James chapter 2, there, there's three different types of faith. There is... Um, Demonic faith. You say, Demo- demonic faith, what's that? The scripture says, you believe in God, you do well. But the devils also believe and tremble. So what's demonic faith? Faith that makes you afraid, makes you aware enough to be afraid, but not aware enough to change. That's demonic faith. There's dead faith. faith dead faith is faith where you, have, where you believe it intellectually but you don't believe it enough to implement it. I believe it in my intellect, but I don't believe it in my implementation. That's dead faith. And then there's dynamic faith. And dynamic faith gives us what I call the I can't help it's. When you actively have dynamic faith, it's not only that, not only can you do something, you can't not do something about it. That's dynamic faith. And here's what Jesus said. I mean, not Jesus. Here's what James said. He said, you see then. He said, well, first he said, show me your faith without your works. That's a challenge. You know why? Because you can't show somebody your faith without your works. Somebody tells you what they believe, that does not show you what they believe. You don't know what somebody believes just because they tell you. You know what somebody believes when you watch what they do, not when you listen to what they say. How many of y'all tracking? Wave at me. So, so, Um, then he said, show me your faith by your works. I mean, without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. But he also said, you see then how faith alone doesn't save someone. What he's saying is you can't see somebody's faith if they don't do something about it. He's not saying faith God, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So I show people what I believe by what I do. God knows what I believe by looking at my heart. So the best advice I can give you in the the mission that you are called on, 
the mission that you are called to, the purpose for your life, which is to yield your life to God as the sovereign king of your life, to rule over your assignment as the sovereign king or queen of your assignment, and to use the assignment that you rule over to serve every human being you come in contact with. The best advice I can give you is this. Be not afraid, only believe. Let's walk in that. I hope this blesses you. Um, if you want to watch another great video that we did, I would recommend highly that you walk, uh, watch the video on um, No Limits. Absolutely, absolutely will take you to another level. Stay blessed by the best. And thank you for liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that other cool YouTube-y stuff you do. And in the meantime, in between time, peace out, Cub Scouts.